Thank you very much. It's so tempting for me to pick up where Victor left off, but I'm going to save that for tomorrow and give the talk I planned for today. Um, so my plan for today is basically going to give to be is is to give a, a an introduction to category O from a, a geometric perspective. So let me set up some notation. So I want to fix G a simple algebraic group. I'll always work over C. And B is going to be a Borel. Borel subgroup. And X is going to be the flag manifold, G mod B. M is going to be the cotangent bundle of x. And Pramod sort of explained how we can think about this. We can think about this as a pair of an element of x and a nilpotent matrix. Or So this is in x cross the nilpotent cone of G with the property that um, if I conjugate a, a by G, in other words, if I apply the adjoint action, um, I land in the Lie algebra of my fixed Borel. Right. So in other words, the cotangent space at a given point to X can be thought of as a certain set of nilpotent elements of the Lie algebra. And that gives me a nice projection to what I'll call M0, which is the nilpotent cone of G which is just remembering A and forgetting the element of X. So this is a resolution of singularities, and it's called the Springer resolution. So if you haven't thought about this much before, let me just give sort of the simplest example. So let me take G to be SL2. So in this case, uh, X is P1. So M is the cotangent bundle of P1. And the nilpotent cone, M0, is just isomorphic to C2 modulo the action of plus or minus 1. So this is, this is maybe the, the example to keep in mind, T star P1 uh, resolving the quadratic cone. Okay. And now I want to define... Oh, maybe I should have put this in the, in the general board. So I want to define Z to be the fiber product of M with itself over M0. So this is something else that Victor talked about in his talks a little bit. This is usually called the Steinberg variety. So what is it here? So here Z is T star P1 cross T star P1 over C2 mod plus or minus 1. So what's this map? The map from M to M0 takes the 0 section, P1, and collapses it. And otherwise, it's 1 to 1. So we have here the diagonal copy of T star P1, as well as P1 cross P1. Right? This notation, fiber product, means we take something in here and something in here that go to the same place. So how can that happen? Either they have to be the same element, or I have something that lies in the zero section here and something that lies in the zero section here, in which case they both get collapsed to the cone point. They don't have to be the same element. So I get T star P1, union P1 cross P1, and they're, they're touching along the diagonal copy of P1. Okay. So a general fact, which also appeared in Victor's lectures, so luckily he covered everything for me, the fact is that... Um, well, this, this variety Z, the Steinberg variety, it's always going to have multiple components. Like here, it has two irreducible components. They're all going to have the same dimension. And it's going to be the same as the dimension of M. 
right? One of the components of z is always going to be the diagonal copy of m, right? I always have the diagonal copy of m inside of this fiber product. That's going to be one of the irreducible components. There's going to be a bunch of irreducible components. They're all going to have the same dimension, which I'm going to call z, d. So this is the statement that that map is, the map from m to m0 is strictly semi-small, which Victor talked about a little bit. Okay, so I need one more definition that hasn't appeared yet, so I'm going to call this m plus, and this is going to be the union of all the conormal bundles to the b orbits in x. If you like, these b orbits are sometimes called Schubert varieties, so these are the conormals to the Schubert varieties. So again, let me illustrate this in, in my example. So, um, so again, in my SL2 example, so here x is p1, cp1, which I'm going to think of as c union the point in infinity. Right? And these are the b orbits. So one b orbit is everything but the North Pole, and the other is the North Pole. And that means that m plus is the conormals to it, so it's C itself union the cotangent fiber at infinity. So if I want to draw a picture, here's my P1. So here's one component of m plus, and here's infinity. So the other component of m plus is a copy of C that's just touching it there. It's the fiber to the cotangent bundle just at that point. That's my m plus. Okay. So now I want to consider the borel moore homology group in dimension 2D of Z. So this is just, this is the top group. So this is, this is just C to the number of components of Z. So I have I have one cycle for each component of z, and, and that's the whole group. So this is the, the group with basis given by the irreducible components of z. Okay. And Victor sort of maybe mentioned near the end of his talk that this is an algebra. It has a convolution product that I think he didn't explain, and I also won't explain, but I'll, I'll come a little closer to explaining. So if you take the triple product of m instead of the double, there are three ways to project this down to the double product. Remember, z is m cross m over m0. So I can forget about any one of these factors, and I get three different maps to z, p1, p2, and p3, all going to z, which is just the double product of m. And now the algebra structure is going to be given by pulling back and pushing forward. So let's see. Oh, oh this is Victor's. Okay. <laughs> right, so the definition of the convolution of alpha and beta, where alpha and beta are homology classes on Z, is just I pull alpha back using P1, and I take some intersection upstairs with the pullback of beta using P3. And then I use P2 to project it back down. So I'm being a little vague about these operations, but, uh, but this is the idea of how you make that group into an algebra. So I also want to think about the d-dimensional Borel-Moore homology of m plus, which again, I sort of set this up such that it's the, it's the top dimensional piece. So again, I have sort of a basis element for each component of m plus. Right, so z is twice as big as m plus. That's why I have a 2d on the z and a d on the m plus. So again, this is c to the number of components. And so that was an algebra. This is going to be a module. So this is a 
module over the algebra H2D BM of Z by a similar convolution construction that I won't write down. But same idea as this. You can multiply two classes there, or you can take a class there and multiply it by a class here and get another class here. This is an algebra. So a theorem, which is essentially due to Ginsburg, I don't think I've seen it stated exactly this way, but it follows from something very similar, is that, well, okay, this part is, is definitely unambiguously um, in his book, for example, as he's already advertised. So this, as an algebra, is isomorphic to just the group ring of the vial group of G. So that's nice. And our module over it, M plus, is also isomorphic to C of W. But now I'm talking about the regular representation. So this you should interpret as an algebra, and this you should interpret as a module over this algebra, namely the regular representation. So that's very nice. It gives a, a very nice geometric construction of the regular representation of the vial group of a simple algebraic group G. Okay, so one can ask then, you know, who cares? I mean, we, we know how to construct the regular representation of a group. What do you get out of this? Well, there are lots of nice answers. One answer is that geometrization often leads to categorification. Right? So if you can take um, actions in representation theory and construct them geometrically, that often gives you a clue of how to categorify them. Right, I have some geometric representation of, of a group on this vector space, and I can ask myself, can I realize this vector space as a shadow of some geometrically defined category, maybe a category of sheaves, and then take my group action on this vector space and lift it to a group action on the category that recovers this when I pass to the Grotendi group. So that's what I want to try to do. And I'm going to fail, actually, but I'll fail in an interesting way. So let's see. OK. So remember, x was g mod b. So we have an action of g on x just by left multiplication. And that means that for every element of the Lie algebra, G, which you can think of as an infinitesimal element of G, I get an infinitesimal automorphism of X, in other words, a vector field. Right. Um, and now, just by multiplying them together, I can get an algebra map for the, from the universal enveloping algebra of G to to the algebra of differential operators on X. Right? This is sort of things generated by G, the algebra generated by G, and this is the algebra generated by vector fields. So if you like, I'll write this as sections over X of the, the sheaf of differential operators. Okay, so the first fact I want to state is that this map is surjective. And I want to write, I mean, this is maybe a little silly, but I want to write UG sub zero as UG mod the kernel of this map, which of course. Well, if I take a subjective map and I look at the source mod the kernel, it's isomorphic to the target. But I want to write it this way as UG sub zero to emphasize that it's a quotient of U of G. Okay. And the famous theorem of Valenson and Bernstein
says that if I take, well, if I take modules over UG0 and another, and I also take D modules on X, I have two functors between them, right? I can take their global sections. So if I take a D module and I take global sections, I get a module over this ring, which is UG0. So that's a functor in this direction. And I can sort of do the opposite. I can take a, a module over the algebra and localize it to get a D module on X. And the theorem says that, that these are inverse equivalences of, of categories. So this is really nice. This says we can take these algebraic objects, modules over the universal enveloping algebra, or if you like, some kind of G modules, and we can think of them as geometric objects, as sheaves. And this has a lot of wonderful benefits. One of the benefits is that we can sort of talk about cycles. Right? So a module here, if we think of it as a sheaf, it has some kind of support cycle, which we can then do something with. UG0 modules, I can now localize them and think of them as D modules on X. And now I can take, well, okay, this is, this is I guess, something that, um, that Ed talked about a little bit this morning. If you take a D module and try to think about its support cycle, that naturally lies not on X but on its cotangent bundle. So this is a procedure called microlocalization. So I'll just sort of put in quotes, microlocal support. And what I get is a cycle on M, which is the cotangent bundle of X. So this is something I haven't really defined, but the point is you have a D module on X, and you can naturally cook up a cycle on the cotangent bundle of X. Well, what is it that we were trying to categorify? We were trying to categorify the Borel-Moore homology of M plus. So we're not actually looking for cycles on M. We're looking for cycles on M plus. So that tells me I shouldn't be thinking about this category if I want to categorify the construction I had in the beginning. I want to find some subcategory here such that I mean, it consists of modules such that when I do this and take a cycle, it will land not on M, but on M plus. So I want to find the right subcategory here. Okay. Well, this subcategory is called category O. And let me give a definition. So this, well, okay, the experts in the audience will immediately be able to tell that I'm cheating somewhere, but let me, give me a minute and I'll try to talk my way out of the hole. So, the definition I'm going to give is that this category is finitely generated modules, UG0 modules, that are locally finite for the action of U of B. Right? So if I have an action of u of g 0, then I have an action of u of g, because u g 0 is a quotient of u of g. And u of b is a subalgebra of u of g. So I can look at the guys that are locally finite for that. That means I have a vector, and I hit it with this infinite dimensional algebra. And I expect to get an infinite dimensional vector space, but maybe I only get a finite dimensional vector space. That's what it means to be locally finite. So if I have something that's locally finite for this guy, well, that condition tells me exactly that I can integrate it to a, from a little b action to a big b action, which, if you follow through all this nonsense, will tell me that my support, my microlocal support, is contained in the conormals to the b orbits, which is exactly what I wanted to happen. So this definition is cooked up precisely to give me something here whose cycle will land on the uni union of the conormals to the b orbits. M plus. Okay. So the thing that I lied about, so this is not what's usually called category O. Usually in category O, uh, you don't insist that the center act with a fixed central character, which I've done. You 
you weaken that a little bit, but then you add another hypothesis that the Cartan acts semi-simply. So I've, I've cheated a little here, but it's a theorem of Zergel, at least in this specific context, that the category I defined is equivalent to what's usually called a regular block of category L. And this one somehow is, comes up more naturally uh, from the geometric picture that I'm describing right now. Maybe I should write something in the middle here. I should write weekly uh, V equivariant V modules. Right, this, this local finiteness condition that I'm imposing over here exactly uh, translates to a B equivariance condition here, which translates to cycle lying on M plus. And then one can show that exactly what I wanted to happen does happen. So if I look at the Grotendi group, the complexified Grotendi group, I sort of pick an element here, represent it by a module, look at its characteristic cycle, then I get a well-defined element of HD for L more M plus, and this is actually an isomorphism. So I've succeeded in doing what I wanted to do. I wanted to find some somewhat geomet geometric or representation theoretic category whose Grotendi group is this space that I have a vial group action on. And I do that, and the isomorphism is given exactly by this microlocal support map. OK, so what's the next step? I have this convolution action here. And I want to try to lift that to a convolution action here. Right. Okay. So, um, okay, if we have some category of modules, how do we get a categorical action on it? Well, you can tensor with a bimodule. Right? A good way to act on a category of modules is to have a tensor category of bimodules and, and tensor with that. So to categorify this action, I now want to look at UG0 bimodules. So what are they localized to? Well, a bimodule, an A bimodule is an A tensor A op module, right? So this will be sort of DX tensor DX op mod. Right? I want to say that it's a D module on X cross X. It isn't quite that. It's a D module on the first factor, and it's an opposite of a D module on the second factor. Okay. And but you should think of it as something like a D module on X cross X. So when I take its microlocal support, where will I land? Well, it'll be on the cotangent bundle of X cross X, which is just the cotangent bundle of X cross this cotangent bundle of X. So I get a cycle on M plus N cross M. Okay. Um, but of course, I'm not interested in cycles on M cross M. I'm interested in cycles on Z. Remember, Z was a subset of M cross M. Z is the stuff on M cross M that projects to the same place in M0. So if I want to find the right bimodules to tensor with and stay in category O, I should find whatever bimodules here have cycles on Z rather than M cross M. I'm going to define the right category here, and it's called the category of Harish Chandra bimodules. So uh, let me define that. So this is finitely generated UG0 bimodules. that are locally finite for the adjoint action. U of G is a Hopf algebra, so I can talk about the adjoint action on a bimodule. And I can look at some local finiteness condition for the adjoint action. So what's going to happen here, just like over there, in the middle I'm going to have, this is going to give me some integrability condition. 
So I'm going to have G equivariant D modules on X cross X, where by D modules I really mean D module on the first factor and opposite D module on the second factor. And then when I take its cycle, I'm going to get something that lands in the union of the conormal bundles of the G actions on X cross X, and that turns out to be Z. So that's a little exercise that I've suppressed. But this is, the point is that this is exactly the right category of bimodules whose cycles land on Z. So now, I hope I've set things up so that the theorem I will state seems like the most natural thing in the world. Let's see. The theorem, well first, this HC0 is a tensor category acting on O0. Basically says if you tensor together two of these bimodules, you'll get another one of these bimodules. And if you tensor one of these bimodules with an object of O, you'll get another object of O. Um, second, and maybe this is the most important, support this microlocal cycle, microlocal support uh, operation intertwines derived tensor product with convolution. So this is really two statements here. One is if I take two bimodules and tensor them together and then support, take their support, I get the product of their supports in uh, the Borel-Moore homology group. And second, if I take a harsh Chandra bimodule and an object of O, and I tensor them together and then I take their support, I get the thing I get by taking the cycle here and letting it act on the cycle here. This perfectly categorifies things. Um, the third is a little less obvious. So, okay, I had, um, so if I just look at the Borel-Moore homology here, remember that was the group ring of the vial group. So I had the group ring of the vial group acting on uh, the Borel-Moore homology of M plus, which is the, the Grotendieck group of O. So one might hope that this construction gives me an action of the vial group on the category O0. So it turns out to be not quite as good, or maybe not quite as bad. So there exist bimodules HW for all W and W, hard Chandra bimodules, such that, well, first of all, tensor product with HW is an equivalence, at least on the level of the derived categories. Okay, so it's sort of an invertible transformation of this category. And second, maybe this is the more important thing, so let me call this equivalence theta sub w. So now I want to write theta sub w composed with theta sub w prime is naturally isomorphic as a functor to theta sub w w prime. Well, okay, if I stopped here, this would tell me exactly that I have a vial group action on the category. But in fact, this only holds if the length of w plus the length of w prime is equal to the length of w w prime. So, so these functors compose the way I want them to if the lengths are actually adding, but they're not if it do, they don't if they don't add. For example, if w is a simple transposition and w prime is equal to w, that means their product is the identity, so this fails. So if I do a tra simple transposition and do it again, I don't have any conditions. So this exactly tells me, well, for example, if W is the symmetric group, it tells me that I have an action not of the symmetric group, but of the braid group. So if I look at, if I look at the group generated by the elements of W, modular the relations that W W prime equals W W prime 
if and only if this length condition holds, I get not w, but the braid group associated to w. So let me write that over here. So I'll just emphasize again, if I'm working with SLN, so W is the symmetric group on N elements, what I'm getting is not an action of the symmetric group on category O. I'm getting an action of the braid group on category O, where if you pass to the Grotendieck group, the pure braids are acting trivially, and all I have is an action of the symmetric group. But if you look on the categorical level, I have something much more interesting, namely an action of the braid group. This categorifies. Great. Any questions? So that, that's half the talk. So what's the other half? So, um, I mean, category O was introduced a while ago, always in the context of Lie theory. And you know, I started by defining a, a simple algebraic group and going from there. What I want to convince you now is that category O has absolutely nothing to do with Lie theory. Can I say what the bimodules are? Um, so, so this is the precise definition. Ah, sorry, these bimodules. Um, yeah, so okay. um, I'd be happy to tell you afterward. How about that? <laughs> um, maybe the short answer is that there's some sort of wall crossing functors that correspond to changing the quant well, okay, I haven't talked about quantizations yet. Okay, let me maybe maybe I can sort of answer in the context of the second half of the talk and then then more probably. And more big chalks. Okay, so let me tell you what a conical symplectic resolution is. Well, first of all, a smooth variety. One over C. So here you should think of the cotangent bundle of the flag variety. Um, a symplectic form. algebraic symplectic form on M. So for example, a cotangent bundle is always symplectic. Okay. Here's a slightly strange part. Um, commuting actions of S, which is a copy of C star, and T, which is a copy of C star. So in other words, I have two C star actions on my variety. They're going to play extremely different roles, which is why I'm giving the groups that are acting two different names, S and T. So it's two actions of the same group, but they're going to um, they're going to play very different roles. The things you should keep in mind are on the cotangent bundle of the flag variety, the S action is going to be the action that scales the fibers of the cotangent bundle. In particular, it doesn't preserve the symplectic form. It scales the symplectic form. And the T action is going to come from a generic co-character of G. Right, so if I pick some some uh, homomorphism from C star into G, I get an action on G mod B, which is X, and that induces an action on T star G mod B, which preserves the symplectic form. So they're very different actions. So what properties do I want? Down here. So, so the T action should preserve the symplectic form. 
the S action should scale the symplectic form. So in other words, if I pull back omega along the S action and I just multiply it, um, the S action is what makes it conical. So S acts on C of M with non-negative weights. And zero weight only in only for the constants. Okay. So this is some sort of cone condition. Um, okay. um, fourth, M should have isolated fixed points. And finally, this one is maybe a little weird, um, the map, if I take M and map it to M0, which is by definition spec of functions on M, it's the universal affine guy to which M at maps. It's the, the guy you get by collapsing all the projective subvarieties of M. So this should be projective resolution. So again, when m is t star g mod b, m0 is going to be the nilpotent cone. It's going to be the thing that you obtain by collapsing all projective subvarieties of, of t star g mod b. And if you like, this condition is exactly saying that m0 is a cone with everything being contracted by the s action to a unique cone point. What's that? Yeah. Uh, right, projective and birational, yes. And an isomorphism over the singular locus. I mean, an isomorphism away from the singular locus. Right. Okay. So, I mean, these are a lot of technical conditions, maybe not the most enlightening thing. Let me give you a bunch of examples. So, we've seen one example, which is the first one I'll write down. And in fact, we've seen lots of other examples in other talks, so I'll just point this out to you. So, uh, so the first example is the one that I've been talking about for the first half hour. So M is T star G mod B, and M0 is the nilpotent cone in G. So here, S scales the fibers, and T is some generic co-character of G. So another example that we've seen, I guess, in Victor's talk um, is if M is the Hilbert scheme of N points on a resolution of C2 mod gamma, where gamma is some subgroup of SL2, and M0 is the symmetric scheme of N points on C2 mod gamma itself, not the resolution. And I should be a little careful. Uh, this would be a nice class of examples if I left out this bit about the T action. If I want to actually have an action of T with isolated fixed points, I should actually take gamma to be abelian. So gamma should be Z mod K acting one way on the first factor of C2 and, and the other way on the second factor. And the third example is also something that Victor has been talking a lot about in his lectures. So if I take any linear representation of a group, okay, and I take any character of G, I can look at the induced action of G on the cotangent bundle of V. And that's going to have a moment map, which takes values in the dual of the Lie algebra of G. And now I can take M to be mu inverse of 0 
take a GIT quotient with respect to the character chi of G, so this means impose some stability condition and then mod out by G, then I can take M0 to be just the straight categorical quotient of mu inverse of 0 by G. And I need some extra assumptions to make sure that I have a conical S action and a T action with isolated fixed points. But at least I'm always going to get something like this via this construction. So examples, well, quiver varieties are all of this form. So this is exactly how, how Victor defined quiver varieties. This V was the representation space of a quiver, and this G was the product of general linear groups corresponding to the nodes of the quiver. Um, and other spaces you get this way are called hypertoric varieties. When, uh, when the group G is taken to be abelian, and V is anything, G is some torus and V is anything, this is called a hypertoric variety. This is another very nice source of examples of these resolutions. Okay. So what I want to tell you now is that I can do everything I did before, replacing T star G mod B with one of these M's. And I can again define a category O and an action and sort of all the, all the wonderful structure I had in the, in the first half of the talk I have in this section. So the, the thesis of this talk is that category O is about symplectic resolutions. The Springer resolution is one example of a symplectic resolution, and this gives you classical category O. But every sufficiently nice symplectic resolution gives you some version of category O, and they're all they all have the same wonderful structure and properties as, um, as the classical one. OK, so let me try to imitate my construction. So let z again be m cross m0 for m. I need an m plus, too. So I'm going to take m plus to be the set of points in m such that they have a limit under the t action as t goes to 0. So this is not obviously the same as my previous definition, but it's maybe instructive to think about the case of T star P1. If you're on T star P1, if you have a point on the zero section, then sure, it's going to have a limit. So every point on the zero section is going to have a limit. Uh, points in cotangent fibers are probably not going to have limits unless it happens to be in the cotangent fiber over infinity, in which case it's being pulled down to, to that point. Everything else in some other fiber is just going to go up to infinity. So I'm going to get the same answer. So that's my M plus. Okay. Well, now I can do the same constructions and. This is roughly in, well, I, this is pretty much exactly in Victor's book. So, so again, the Borel Moore homology of Z is an algebra, and it acts on the Borel Moore homology of M, plus, which is a module. And again, if you're not so happy with Borel Moore homology, this just has a basis given by the components of Z. This has a basis given by the components of M, plus, and the action. It's given by pushing and pulling, pulling and pushing along one of these correspondences. So that's before. Okay. And just like before, I want to now define some category, some module category that has this as its Grotendieck group. And I want to take these convolution operators on the Grotendieck group and categorify, categorify them to give some bimodules acting on my module category. OK, so what did I do last time? I started talking about D modules on X. But one thing we don't have here is an analog of X. Right before our m was t star of x, we had a base of the cotangent bundle. 
Now my M is some symplectic variety that's not necessarily the cotangent bundle of anything. So I need some replacement for D modules on X. And the appropriate re replacement is a quantization of M. So let me describe that. So a quantization of M Well, a T equivariant sheaf, we call it curly A, of filtered algebras on M. And uh, T cross S graded isomorphism between uh, the associated graded of A and the algebra of functions on M. Usually I'd write this as O sub M, but we're already using O. So this is just the structure sheaf of M, the sheaf of functions on M. Right, so A is some sheaf of filtered algebras, T equivariant. So when you take GER A, you get a T equivariant sheaf of graded algebras. Well, you can think of the grading as defining an S action, because S is C star. So now you, take an, now you have a T cross S equivariant sheaf of algebras, and you want that to be functions on M, T cross S equivariant. Um, and finally, well, maybe I won't write this in the interest of time, but I'll say it. Um, if you take functions and realize them as the associated graded of something non-commutative, that induces a Poisson bracket on the space of functions. And I want that Poisson bracket to agree with the one induced by the symplectic form. So it's really a quantization of, of m comma omega. So in other words, I can't do a stupid thing and let, let a just be the sheaf of functions with the trivial filtration, because then I would get the trivial Poisson bracket here, and it would correspond to the, the zero two form, which is not my symplectic form. So what does this have to do with D modules? Okay, I didn't write this, but um, this was also sort of explained by Ed in his talks, that if I have um, differential operators on X, I can sort of pull them back to, to a sheaf of modules over, over the cotangent bundle of X, and I get exactly a quantization. Right, so you can think of differential operators as X, on X as a quantization of the cotangent bundle of X. And that's why the microlocal support of a D module lies not in X but in the cotangent bundle of X. So a D module on X you can think of as a sheaf over some non-commutative sheaf of algebras, sheaf of modules over some non-commutative sheaf of algebras on the cotangent bundle, in which case uh, microlocal support is just support. So this really generalizes the notion of differential operators on the base when you have a cotangent bundle. Okay, so now I want to let, let A be the algebra of global sections. So what kind of algebras arise this way? Let me go back to my examples of symplectic resolutions, which I guess are gone now. I have example three. Um, okay, so if, uh, if M is T star G mod B, then A is exactly going to be a quotient of U of G. It's not always going to be U of G zero. I can get any central quotient of U of G if I take not differential operators, but some twisted differential operators. Um, second example is if M is the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on C2 mod gamma, then A is a quotient of a spherical rational Cherednik algebra. I'm not going to say what it is, and I don't really care what it is, but maybe the point I want to make is that it's something with a name, right? So <laughs> the algebras that arise this way are not crazy things. These are algebras that representation theorists care about, 
you know, algebras that people study in representation theory. You know, just like in example one, where we got something familiar, a quotient of the central quotient of the universal enveloping algebra. Here we're getting a central quotient of the spherish co-rational Trednik algebra, which is an algebra of independent interest. Maybe I'll just give three corresponding to that case. So three, if M is a quotient of T star V by G, then A is a quotient of the ring of G invariant differential operators on V. It's also sort of a nice thing to say. Right? It's a relatively natural ring to write down. So these, these rings A, these quantizations that we're getting, are, are, are nice algebras, algebras whose representation theory might be of, of inter intrinsic interest. So now here's a theorem that's maybe sort of an asymptotic version of the Balance and Bernstein theorem that I wrote down before. So this is due to Braden, myself, and Webster. Well, again, we have these localization and uh, sections functors. So from straight A mod to curly A mod. So these are sheaves of algebras over this, sorry, sheaves of modules over this sheaf of algebras. And these are modules over this algebra. So this is global sections and this is loc. And this, well, is an equivalence for most quantizations. Well, there are lots of different ways to choose a quantization, and it won't always be equivalent, an equivalence, but it'll often be an equivalence. And what's meant by most, well, I won't make this precise now, but one thing I'll say is it means different things depending on whether you care about abelian equivalences or derived equivalences. If it's abelian equivalences, then it's, yeah, sort of most. If it's derived equivalences, it's even more most. <laughs> and um, maybe I'll just give a slight plug for uh, McGurdy and Nevins have a, a couple of papers that really talk about how to figure out exactly when this is an equivalence and when it isn't. Both, I think, one paper in the derived case and one paper, paper in the abelian case. So you can, you can say quite a bit about when it's a, an equivalence, but for now, I want to satisfy myself by saying it's not hard to find quantizations for which it is an equivalence. Well, now I want to do exactly what I did before. I want to look at A modules. And I want to localize them to get curly A modules, script A modules. And I want to take their support in the appropriate sense and get cycles on M. Okay, But I didn't really want cycles on M. Remember, I'm trying to categorify cycles on M plus. So I really want to land in cycles on M plus. So I should define the appropriate category here such that I'll land in cycles on M plus. And we're going to call it category O. And these are finitely generated A modules that are locally finite for, OK, before I wrote U of B, but I don't have a B here, so I need the appropriate uh, replacement for U of B. I'm going to write it A plus, where this comes from the T action. So remember, T is acting everywhere. T is a copy of C star, and that gives me an integer grading on A. So by A plus, I mean all the stuff in non-negative degree. So A0, A1, A2, A3, and not the negative part. So that's a subalgebra, and I want it to be locally finite for the action of that subalgebra. And it turns out that's exactly what I need to land in M plus. It's not true that in the Springer resolution case, A plus is equal to U of B. But it's close enough to being equal to U of B that the condition that this acts locally finitely is the same as the condition that U of B acts locally finitely. And then a theorem. These are the same guys plus Tony Licata, is that the induced map on Groton D groups is an isomorphism. So the complexified Groton D group of O 
maps isomorphically to the borel moore homology of M plus. So I did successfully categorify this group. And now I want to take the next natural step. I had a convolution action of cycles on Z on that group, and I want to categorify that to some bimodule action on category O. So again, I have A bimodge, bimodules, and I localize, and that takes me to A tensor A op modules. So these are sheaves of modules over a sheaf of algebras, which is a quantization of M cross M. So I take support, and I get a cycle on M cross M. Okay. But I don't want cycles on M cross M. I want cycles on the subvariety Z. Getting low on this one, too. So I wanted to find the appropriate category here whose support cycles are going to land on Z. And well, by analogy, we're going to call that the category of Harish Chandra bimodules. And, well, so I want to write down a definition. Well, this is a little trickier to define. Before I talked about the adjoint action, but now my A is not going to be a Hopf algebra, so I don't have an adjoint action anymore. So let me write it this way. It's sort of N such that GUR of N, once I take the associated graded, now it's a sheaf on M, now it's an abelian thing. It's a sheaf on M0 across M0, and I want it to be supported on the diagonal. It's, it's exactly the technical condition I need for my support cycle to land in Z. OK, so now just one more board. Let me write down a, the exact analog of the theorem I had at the end of the first half. This is BPW again. So first of all, HC is a tensor category acting on O. In other words, when you tensor two uh, Harish Chandra bimodules, you get another one. And when you tensor a Harish Chandra bimodule with a module in O, you get another module in O. Second, support intertwines tensor product with convolution. Take two bimodules and tensor them together and then take their cycle. That's the same as taking their cycles and convolving them. And three, well, I'll write it a little more vaguely. There exist nice bimodules that fit together. Um, into a generalized grade group action. on the derived category of L. And now, finally, I can come a little closer to answering your question about what are these bimodules. You should think of them as some sort of wall crossing functors. If I quantize not the structure sheaf but a line bundle, that will give me a bimodule that takes me from one quantization to another quantization, a different quantization. And then if I take the inverse line bundle, I can go back from the new quantization back to my old quantization. And this composition, will not be the identity. It's going to be some interesting sort of wall crossing functor, and, and that's roughly where these bimodules come from. So I couldn't, couldn't quite say that in the first half because I wasn't talking about quantizations. If I wanted to say that in the context of D modules, I'd say you quantize a line bundle to go from D modules to twisted D modules, and then back to D modules, and that's where you get your functors. OK, so I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, the analog of the vial group is called the Namakawa vial group. 
So Namakawa associated a group to any of these symplectic resolutions, and it acts by reflections on, uh, on the second cohomology. So if you start with the Springer resolution, you really get the vial group. Okay. Um, it could be that the Namakawa vial group is trivial, and you're still going to get something interesting here. You should think of the thing you get here as something like the, the pure braid group. So the interesting thing you'll get here will act trivially on, on cohomology. In general, you're going to get some interesting generalized braid group action on cohomology, um, sorry, on, on the derived category. And when you pass to the Grotendi group, it's going to factor through the action of the Namakawa vial group, which may or may not be trivial, but it'll definitely be much less interesting than before. Uh, okay, I think I'm going to be off by, uh, it's either, it's either Z mod N or S N. So I'm possibly off by a duality, so I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's Z mod N. Yeah, um, no, I don't have any good fancy way to say what's in the middle there. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, well, um, one way to say it is it's just going to be, no, I don't have any good way to say it other than th to say that it cycle lies on M plus. Somehow you really have these extra group actions in the Springer case that allows you to, gives you extra nice ways to say things. And I don't have a good substitute for that. I don't think so. I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of foundational work by Kaleiden and and Namakawa and others on the geometry of symplectic resolutions that are really nice. Um, if you allow yourself only Poisson manifolds, well, I mean, you can have anything with the trivial Poisson structure. And, I mean, we're using a, a lot of a lot of foundational work that other people develop that really requires symplectic. Yeah, um, I, the, I was seeing the relative vial group for the first time this morning. So, <laughs> so it, if it occurs in my picture, I, I don't understand it yet. No, no, I mean, uh, yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the case of the Springer resolution, if you work with honest D modules, then you get the zero uh, central character. If you work with twisted D modules, which are the other quantizations of T star G mod B, then you can get all the other characters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, everything works exactly as before. I just. I just wanted to uh, wait on saying twisted in the first half. But yeah, I mean, if I had said twisted, then, then you could get arbitrary central quotients of U of G. OK, so I mean. Well, again, I wanted it to be symplectic. So, I mean, do you want some partial resolution? Or? I mean, sort of a map of symplectic to a vacuum of A. Ah. For instance, things like metamorphic and some of them. OK, wait, so you want to drop the assumption that M is smooth, or drop the assumption that it's an isomorphism away from the singular locus? Drop the assumption that it's an isomorphism. OK. Yeah, again, I don't know. I mean, I'm. Um, there's all this foundational work by uh, Namakawa and Kaleiden on symplectic resolutions and exactly the kind of things you get from symplectic resolutions. And we use, we use their work uh, a huge amount. So, I mean, it's maybe a good question. And for example, semi-smallness of this map was extremely important. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure what assumptions there can be dropped. But, uh, 
best I can do.